Okay, so I'm working on my 2011 EcoBoost. Um, as you can see, pulling the headlights out, changing them out to LEDs. I already did the fog lights, which are easy. Show you down in here. You can see the fog light bulb right there. Those are H10s. Um, and the headlight bulbs are H13, which are these here. You can see they look the same, and they literally are the same bulb, except for the H13s have a different mounting collar that they put on there from the manufacturer of the bulb. And the plug on the harness has three pins in it instead of two, and the ballast is different. You can see this, uh, I shouldn't call it a ballast, the LED driver is square. Whereas the uh, the one for the fog light is more roundish, I guess you could say. Um, and I did order them at a little bit different times, so it could just be a matter of when they were manufactured by that manufacturer, or it, it could be inherent in the design of the fact that one has two pins and one has three pins for the high and low beam. So your fog light will just have a ground and a hot and the, um, the uh, LED headlight will have a ground and a low beam and a high beam wire. I'm not really sure which is which on this. I'm going to guess that green is ground, but not necessarily. Um, that's green, then black, then looks like red, or purple with a red stripe. Um, but anyway, yeah, so ground, high, low beam hots on the uh, H13 for the headlight. Uh, like I said, both bulbs look identical. I'll give you a look at one here. This is the bulb. It's got a glass cover over it. That end cap there, that aluminum end cap unscrews. And you can take the glass off. Uh, I think they even offer, I'm not sure, but I thought I seen on eBay that they offered different uh, colored glass lenses for that. Um, like I said, the only difference is they put a different collar on here to make it a H10 or H13 uh, fitment because the, uh, I'm getting a lot of glare here, I'm trying to show you this, there we go. The locking tabs are different on this one than they are on the H10 uh, fog light bulbs, otherwise they look the same. This has four Cobb LEDs, you can see the offset on them is different from the uh, high beam and the low beam. I believe that I'm not sure which ones are high, which ones are low. I think these are low beam right here. And then those are the high beam and the high beam ones are off normally and then they only kick on when you put the high beam on. Otherwise just the two upper ones are on for low beam. And whereas the fog light one, all four of them are lit up all the time. So I'll continue on with this video when I pull the other headlight out. So anyways, I started pulling the other headlight out and I figured I better show you how to pull these out. Um, so what you're going to do is there's a little... I'm getting a lot of glare here. I'm trying to show you this. There's a little clip here that is right at the top inside of the headlight. You unscrew it with a Phillips head and then you just pull on it and it comes out. Um, I unscrewed it all the way and then I pulled this out and then I just screwed it in a little bit so I don't lose the piece. That comes out and the whole flap on this side flips out of the way. Um, the other side Oh, I see why, because this is, this flap is, uh, the 
Yeah, I don't know if it's ripped or what the deal is. I think that's all of the flap on that side. The other one seemed like it was a little longer. Yeah, it is. The other one goes down further, it seems like. But still, same thing. You got the one little piece there that you take out. And then uh, you can fold this out of the way. And when you do fold it out of the way, you can get to see the headlight here has a molded on bracket with one 10 millimeter bolt and I'm just using a quarter inch drive ratchet with a 10 millimeter deep socket which makes it easier taking that one out then on top here you got two more 10 millimeter bolts and then once you take those out you have to try to kind of get your fingers in here a little bit and then you can grab it by the top or grab it by Put your hand right in here, your left hand in here like this, grab it to help you pull and you got to pull straight forward on it um, and get it to pop because there's retainer clips. As you can see right here, there's a retainer clip there and then one down here um, that clip into back into here, into these holes. Or no, it clips into these slots here. The hole is what the uh, alignment pin lines up to, and the slot is where the clip pops into. And you have one on the top, one on the bottom. You got another alignment pin, and then your clip. And same thing. You got a hole and a slot right there that they pop into. So uh, yeah, you really got to tug on it firmly. You don't want to yank it clear across your yard because the wire is only so long you just want to tug it enough to pop it out and then be gentle with it not to scratch your paint and stuff um, and then it's just a quarter turn to the left and I believe it is and then the bulb comes out let me see let's verify that yeah I think it's a quarter turn to the left and then the bulb comes out. Um, let's look at the other one here. Yeah, I think it is. Anyway, it's a quarter turn. And the bulb comes out. And then a quarter turn and your new bulb goes in. So these were a little tight because these aftermarket ones, the little... Uh, mounting ears or tabs or whatever you call them that are I'm trying to get you some light here these little ears here that lock it in for some reason are a little bigger on the aftermarket H or LED than they are on the uh, factory um, halogen for some reason I don't know why but they still fit I just had to really fight with it and wiggle it in there and finally got it so that's something you might have to contend with depending on what quality and brand of bulbs you get um, these were fairly cheap in the price range um, these are uh, 6000 K LEDs like I said Cobb LEDs which is what I prefer because with the Cobbs you get less shadowing and um, you know the the shadow and ghosting effects and all it just seems more smooth like more of a smooth light to me because the LEDs are longer there's more different reflective angles that they're reflecting off the reflector and it just gives you a, what seems to be a smoother light to me um, but that's just my opinion I've had HIDs and quite expensive HIDs in my 04 F-150 and I had one of the good ballasts go out, so I bought some cheap ballasts. And then I had flickering issues and stuff, and I didn't feel like spending the money on good ballasts. And by that time, LEDs were getting cheaper and more abundant. So I went with the LEDs in that truck. And coincidentally, those bulbs are the same bulbs in the 04 that they are in the 2011. So I pulled them out of there, put the factory bulbs back in, since I'm getting ready to sell that truck and then swapping them over to here 
So essentially, it's like a free upgrade for me on this truck. Because I already paid for it on the other truck. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And I'm in the process of figuring out the best way I want to zip tie these wires up. Um, that includes the, uh, the fog light wire, because you can see how long it is. You can see the factory plug right here. And that goes to a... And I'm just not getting any light. Okay, there we go. The factory plug goes down to... Over here, there's a little clip in this cross brace here. And uh, so that factory plug is designed to hang down with just a little slack, slack and plug into the bulb. But since we're doing aftermarket LEDs, it has its own long harness, which is fairly long. It's probably about 10 inches just to the little uh, driver module, the LED driver. And then from there, it's probably another 6 inches long to the plug. So you got a good amount of wire, so rather than leaving it hanging down and flopping in the breeze, I'm going to bring it up and zip tie it probably up here on the on the factory harness clip is what I'm thinking. With just a little slack in it like that. Zip tie it there probably. And then I can bring the rest of this harness up and zip tie it onto the main harness that feeds the whole light assembly. You have one main harness here that comes in and it splits off into three. One runs over and feeds your uh, your blinker slash running light bulb, the main one in the front. And then uh, the other little harness comes over and feeds a little side running light, the orange light. And then your main one here feeds your headlight, which of course, now you have a lot flapping in the breeze on that too same deal like I said about 10 inches or so of wire and then the, the LED driver module and then this one has another six inches or seven inches of wire and then the plug so that'll all get zip tied with little zip ties up on the harness and out of harm's way so when you hit a bump it's the modules aren't rattling against the metal or something um, so when I get to that step I'll show you how that looks Okay, so to show you what I did here, um, I used six small black zip ties, and <clears throat> you want to really pay attention to what you're doing here and think about what you're doing, because you got to remember, when you zip tie these wires up, and the whole goal here is to zip tie stuff up so it doesn't rattle around or get banged up or the wires don't swing in the wind every time you hit the gas and the brake and then the wires will be twisting and turning and over time can make them brittle make them you know uh, break <coughs> from you know swinging back and forth so you want to kind of make them snug um, but you got to be mindful that you are going to be putting this headlight back in and it's going to be moving probably about a foot to go back into position so you got to keep that in mind when you're bundling wires and that they're going to be moving and account for that so you can see down here, the uh, fog light bulb, the wire comes up on that one, which works out good. And I just brought it over, put a zip tie, which is hard to see, a zip tie on one side of the factory uh, wire retainer clip that's in this bracket. Zip tied one side of the wire harness and then came over and zip tied the other side of the harness that holds the, uh, <coughs> the LED driver module. So there's no way you could flop around and bang on anything. It's secured right there. And I left a little bit of play on the wire going to the bulb. Um, then you can see here, it comes up. It's zip tied there. And it wraps up and plugs in. <coughs> and here's the factory side of the harness coming up from there. And it comes up and plugs in there and then I got a zip tie which is on the main harness that goes to feed the bulb and the whole housing assembly so that's how that's zip tied so that's the third zip tie two down there on each side of the 
line driver. One up here, that's three. That's holding that out of the way nice and snug. Then <clears throat> off the harness from the bulb, from the LED, I zip tied the factory bulb harness, uh, wire harness that comes off the main harness. I looped it around, zip tied it there. It comes back, loops around. Um, this is the LED driver harness. It loops around and it's zip tied over here on one side of the factory uh, wire harness holder and then on the other side of the driver module it's zip tied over here to the factory harness and uh, so that's it you have one two and then three zip ties there and then number four is over here, and then five, six down there. And then I also checked it. I, I set the, I slowly set the, the light into place or close to being into place. Probably four or five inches out where I could peek in the side here and I could see how the harness is reacting. I could look down in the top. I could pull this flap out of the way and look over here. You could even look from underneath, up behind the uh, defender well cover there, and check your harness, and even reach your hand in there and make sure nothing's getting pulled too hard where it's going to rip a wire out of the socket or anything like that. You, you want them to be snug up there, but you don't want them to be pulling where they're going to rip out or, or get uh, broken. As you can see, I have the headlights sitting kind of there's a lip right here which is hard to see in the glare but there's a, a little lip on the bumper and I have the uh, corner of the blinker part of the assembly kind of sitting right there and then it's just kind of nesting like that and there's a, per a certain balance point you can get where it'll give you enough room to work and get your harness semi-tight um, in a good spot and um, what I'm doing is you can see I got them both out at the same time and I'll wire them both up as similar as I can get them to each other since I like the way the passenger side came out I'm gonna try to replicate that on the driver side another thing too while you're in here there's a couple of things you can't get to unless the lights are out like your uh, and this is a 2011 EcoBoost you can't get to your your uh, windshield wiper pump assembly it's a good time to probably check this look for any leaks uh, maybe look at the condition of the little supply hose there make sure it's not brittle or cracking this does have a, a little loom tube cover on it <clears throat> um, but it wouldn't hurt to just look at that make sure it all looks good while you're in here you, know, you can see it's got its own little harness that goes up and ties in with the headlight harness. Um, also on the passenger side, I mean on the driver side, we have the, um, this is actually a vacuum pump motor that creates vacuum because the, uh, the, the when you're running twin turbos like this on this motor, it doesn't create very good vacuum for your uh, brake booster and stuff like that. Um, I'm not sure what else is running off vacuum on this motor. I know all the AC controls are electronic servo motors. Um, so I'm not sure what else runs off vacuum. If it's just a brake booster, I'm not really sure. I do see a reserve vacuum can over here. I don't quite know why they put it way over here and why they just didn't stuff it up underneath the fender or something under the headlight here with this or even you know if there's a spot right here it could have went so I don't know why they didn't just put it there and just tee the vacuum line right into this line that feeds up and, and simplify it and have less crap under the hood um, don't know the rhyme or reason why they do what they do sometimes uh, because that's a vacuum line and 
is susceptible to high heat right off the turbo and it is going right over the turbo um, so that's something I'll have to check and I bought this vehicle used <coughs> it's got 160,000 miles on it which I know is a good amount allegedly that's not too bad for an eco boost especially this one's been babied its whole life uh, by my friend who was the original owner of it and uh, it's all highway miles so he used it uh, going cross country with his little RV he's got and stuff little pull behind RV camper and um, so I know the whole history of this truck pretty much any aftermarket stuff that was done to it like exhaust and stereo system and all that I did with the exception of the air raid which he actually put this in himself which is a fairly simple thing to do so he did that himself it's just the uh, the upper air box replacement and the filter it still uses all the factory hosing so it didn't take him much to do that um, but the whole stereo system and four inch uh, heartthrob exhaust I did all that stuff so <clears throat> yeah um, that's where we're at with that um, and this thing's got a lot of scratches somebody put on it and it wasn't him anyway what I'm thinking is I'm gonna look to see if I have any Aluma slick because what I would recommend if you're in here get you a can of Aluma slick and spray this whole assembly because it's uh, oxidizing and I can actually rub my finger on it and see the oxidation powder coming off of it but that uh that's the problem with those vac pumps yeah they're there to make extra vacuum to compensate for the turbo motor not making enough vacuum for the brakes but these things go bad and they're very expensive to replace from my understanding I haven't priced one and really don't want to um, but my thought is spray some Aluma Slick on there and it'll help prevent the oxidation at least on the outside. You know, I don't know if uh, if there's a bad seal or anything, you know, but if you spray it all on there and it gets down in the little cracks and crevices, it might prevent oxidation buildup which might spread the plates apart and allow water seepage to get in and oxidize more or whatever. Um, I just see it, you know, I know, I know Aluma Slick puts a little coating on there, so it'd probably help. I can't see it hurting. I could just see it helping the longevity of the pump. Um, with every wipe I do, I see just oxidation dust flying off this thing. You probably can't see it in the video. Well, a little bit. It's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, that's my thing. As you're doing some aftermarket stuff like that, you should always look at everything around it and analyze things and get to learn your vehicle because um, that's how you can do preventive maintenance as well as help, <clears throat> you know, possibly diagnose an issue in the future with your vehicle. Um, obviously, my 04 F-150 is a whole different animal with the 5.4 Triton. It didn't have a vacuum pump or anything like that or turbos or an intercooler or all the extra add-ons intercooler piping and so forth and blow off valves and waste gates and all the good stuff that comes with a twin turbo motor <coughs> um, I've already taken some time to just stand there with the hood open just looking over everything and analyzing where things are and how plumbing is run <coughs> as far as intercooler hoses and and uh, water lines and all that stuff just to get familiar with the animal um, I recommend anybody do that that has you know halfway decent mechanical knowledge of vehicles <coughs> um, just to help you understand what's going on <coughs> and, and possibly better diagnose your vehicle when something goes wrong because um, if you have no clue where anything is and you look under there for the first time and, and you're broke down on the side of the road it could be something stupid like uh, uh, <clears throat> you know a, a turbo hose blowing off you know one of the supply hoses coming off the turbo going into the intercooler or from the intercooler to the throttle body you know one of those connections connections could come loose and blow off 
and then you're sitting there on the side of the road broke down because your vehicle is not running right and it could be something stupid um, so by analyzing this stuff and looking it over and getting familiar with the sounds of the vehicle you know of what what it what sounds it does make and what sounds it doesn't make and um, also gauges you know it's good to have a uh, like I have the SCT tuner, the uh, Livewire TS Plus, which I believe is one of the better ones out there on the market, if not the best. I haven't been able to compare it to a an Edge CTS. Now they got the Edge CTS 2, which in my opinion I would recommend one of those two tuners, either an SCT Livewire TS Plus or the Edge CTS 2. Um, my opinion I think those are the only two worthwhile because you can leave them connected and attached to your windshield or what have you however you want to mount it in there and be able to see all the parameters of your motor <clears throat> um, I've recently realized that this truck has um, wideband O2s in the front and narrow bands in the back I found out well the good thing about that is I don't need a separate um, air fuel gauge. I did buy an expensive uh, AEM, I uh, forget what they call it, uh, Uego or something, the AEM uh, failsafe wideband gauge, uh, air fuel wideband gauge, and that was like $300. And um, I had that in my... 04 F-150 because I was trying to supercharge it with a Roush supercharger and I was going through a, a company doing a, a download tune which turned out to be garbage and I'll do a whole nother video on that but <clears throat> um, yeah so it, you know I was using that for my air fuel and then I realized I was only reading off one side of the motor so I did some custom exhaust work and put an X pipe in. I did. Tr I had true duels on it at one point, and uh, um, I, I welded a O2 sensor bung right in the X pipe. And then uh, I was able to put the wide band in there and read both sides of the motor. But it was still a pain because you know you're dealing. That's already got four O2 sensors, but they're all narrow bands. And then you're putting a fifth O2 sensor in the middle of that. And then you're dealing with catalytic converters, which. I have stainless uh, long tube headers and no cats and that's why I was able to put the wide band in the X pipe because if I had catalytic converters before that you can't do that you got to have your wide band gauge for your air fuel before any catalytic converter so it's reading true air fuel ratio otherwise it, it won't work out right um, <clears throat> so with that being said uh, you know, I have a gauge that I now don't need out of my 04 F-150 and a lot of other things I'm pulling off and putting it back to stock and I'm just going to sell off everything individually. I mean, the, uh, the Roush supercharger is probably good. It was the basic version, non-intercooled. And uh, like I said, I went the wrong direction with possibly the wrong company for a tune and it didn't work out and I just didn't feel like dumping a grand in it to go to a dyno shop and have them dyno it and and you know tune it on a dyno and all that stuff and I couldn't find anybody that was worth a damn to sell me a tune over the internet that I could download uh, I guess I should have just went right to Roush and sent it to them sent the computer to them the ECU out of the truck that's the only way you could do it through Roush and at the time they wanted 125 um, you pay shipping to them and which is I can't see it being more than 25 bucks to ship it to them to eat the actual ECU out of the truck and they, they allegedly have it for a week or so and they then they tune it and ship it back to you with the Roush tune on it and they charge you 125 at least then that's what it was it was 125 and that included the shipping back to you so I don't know if they were paying anywhere from 15 to 25 dollars shipping and so it's worth it just over a hundred bucks for the tune and you got the actual Roush tune anybody that's going that way I recommend you just do that right out of the gate and you know I mean this this tuner company and I'm not gonna bash them yet or say their name unless uh, I do have to get with them and I'll do another video on that 
on what they do for me is because I've had this tune for over two years and it never worked and actually um, there was a point in time where they were even offering me my money back which was only sixty dollars for the tune and I told them oh give me a little bit let me try some more maybe it's a bad sensor or something and they're like all right and then when I realized I could not for the life of me figure out what was wrong with it when I went back to them and said oh yeah it's you know, I, I can't figure it out. It's, I don't see anything on my end. I'll go ahead and take you up on your offer, the money back. And then they didn't want to give me the money back then, all of a sudden, because they decided it was too long. Um, <clears throat> but I'll get into that in another video. Um, so needless to say, I'm still sitting on a $60 worthless tune that never worked for my Roush Supercharger. And I am going to be calling them shortly here in the next week or so and since i pulled the supercharger off i'll see if they want to refund me or if they want to give me some tune for just a naturally aspirated f-150 and upgraded tune um, for the programmer and go from there see what they're willing to do for me i am going to obviously sell the tuner separately from the truck uh, so that's you know a lost cause and i will lose some money on that deal um, Oh, what are you going to do? Sometimes you got to, you know, take the good with the bad. It was cool, pretty cool tuner when, you know, just a can tunes in it. When I was running the truck, normally aspirated, naturally aspirated. But then when I went to the, got the used Roush supercharger and tried to do all that, it just turned out to be a big can of worms and a big pain. And I should have just went right to Roush and got it done right, and it probably would have worked. And now I'll never know what, it, what its capabilities were because I never got it running right. And I went ahead and pulled the supercharger back off, put it all back to stock. Spent a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, I, I do wish that this truck had come up available sooner. Could have saved myself a lot of headache and heartache. Um, but it is what it is. I got it now. It's a whole lot better truck. I'm not so sure that I 100% like the body lines as much as the old one. I mean, they both got pros and cons to them, but I definitely, definitely like the layout of the dash better. I mean, as far as the gauge cluster goes, um, my FX4 over there, yeah, it's four wheel drive, but it just has the uh, basic gauge cluster, no, no bells and whistles on it. I mean, it's just got the uh, little information screen, which just has the basic button coming through the lens that you push to reset for your trip. There's this one trip setting, and that's it. I mean, there's, and it's got, you know, the compass, so, you know, north, south, east, and west, and outside temperature, and that's it. I mean, not a lot of bells and whistles, no steering wheel controls for the radio. I mean, it's lacking a lot, and not to mention the, the dog motor that it has in it, the 5.4 Triton, which is just an absolute dog, and I know from experience. Um, had many people and many vehicles blow my truck away and I could not touch them. Even with the tuner I had on it, still. Yeah, I noticed a little difference. It shifted better, ran a little better. Um, I had all four or five different exhaust systems I put on this thing, like I said, and um, yeah, it just never could do what I thought it should have been able to do for that size motor. 5.4 Triton, and then you come over here to the 3.5 EcoBoost, and this thing is just a friggin' beast. Even stock, this thing just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. Even with the stock exhaust and not touching it and just leaving it factory, it would still blow that truck away in a heartbeat. Um, now you're talking, got the heartthrob exhaust on it. I didn't get to experience it with the stock exhaust. I never drove it with the stock exhaust. Um, it was my friend's truck after all. He said he noticed a huge difference towing his RV with just the heartthrob exhaust. And this is seat of the pants, no dyno trickery going on. This is him towing the RV before and after the heartthrob exhaust. Four inch heartthrob cat back. Uh, he said it was a huge night and day difference and I believe him. He's, he's not a BSer. He's a straight shooter guy and he says it like it is. If it didn't do crap, he would have said it didn't do crap. But he said, yeah, it's a huge difference. And according to uh, 
Stacy David who who did a video and he has a show um, called Gears and there's a video on YouTube that you can look up that shows and he talks about the heartthrob exhaust I think he said it adds I think it was 38 horsepower somewhere in there 36 38 horsepower and like 50 foot pounds of torque or something like that I believe it was 50 foot pounds or close to it that's a huge difference for just a cat back exhaust you're not going to see those kind of gains on a naturally aspirated motor like the 5.4 Triton um, but on a turbo motor when you're uncorking the, the exhaust system and keep in mind this is just uncorking the cat back behind the catalytic converter behind the Y pipe it's not even cutting the Y pipe and putting a bigger Y in there or anything it's still choked down to the Y but then it opens up after that and my friend said what a huge difference in towing his RV passing I mean that's where you're really gonna tell is doing seat of the pants with no load on the vehicle yeah you might feel it but when you're towing you're really going to notice whether there's a difference or not in your upgrades and your mods because um, if you truly are getting foot pounds of torque that's where you're going to see it when you're towing not to say you won't see it when you're not but you'll definitely know it when you're towing if you're really getting the gains or not and he was um, we don't know if the air raid added anything if it does, I'd imagine it's minimal. Um, you know, it does have all the stock uh, uh, inlet in, intake pipe tubing from the factory. That's all stock. The only thing different is the uh, upper part of the box and the filter, which is huge. It's a pretty big, impressive uh, filter. But I could see where there would be a lot of turbulence in here because it chokes down right here. Um, this is an air raid. I, I would have personally went with probably an S and B or uh, Banks or something like that because they have a whole different designed air piping, which is uh, just huge coming out of the cold air box part. Just huge big oval pipe, and then it gently tapers down to where it tees into the two sides, going to the two turbos where it tees off. It's just huge that I could see definitely gaining more power plus I think it's a whole air box on the s and or the banks whereas this is just an upper section I think those are the whole box and they actually have more breather holes underneath and more cold air stuff going on and all that to help get in the cold air much better through the system matter of fact I think they're both closed on top and they're not open like this which I would prefer especially if they have the proper size channels underneath for the cold air inlet um, because I mean this has been on here for a couple years not a big deal but you can see where it starts rubbing into the uh, into the, uh, the heat shield here on the hood it gives you some unpleasant rub marks on it and stuff not a big deal um, I noticed um, when I had the Roush supercharger on my old truck because that um, heat shield on the hood is more softer and pliable it was really ripping it up pretty good because the the Roush supercharger cold air that came with the supercharger kit is more like this style open on top with just a rubber seal that seals against the hood and again I'm not a big fan of that um, that wouldn't definitely wouldn't have been my first choice that probably would have been probably closer to my last choice um, I really don't the only ones I wouldn't have chose below that would have been anyone with aluminum or metal type of intake pipes because you can get heat soak on your air inlet pipes and I don't know why you'd want that when rubber and plastic act like an insulator so it may not look as pretty but I'm not necessarily going for pretty I, I mean if you want pretty you could always paint them with some uh, you know cryolon or uh, Rust-Oleum paint that has the adhesion promoter for plastic and you could always paint these a different color metallic silver or blue or whatever color you want and make them look fancy although keep in mind when you're working under your motor you're probably gonna scratch the hell out of them anyway so I don't know if that's a worthwhile cause I would say just armor all the hell out of everything and make it nice and shiny and clean and it'll look decent. Um, this motor's all dirty right now. I gotta do a real good 
detail and clean on this truck right now I'm just focusing on some basic mods here um, you know I had these uh, LED headlights and I took them out of the other truck and they're just sitting in my house and today's Sunday and I said well it's a good time to mess with this and throw these in I know it shouldn't take more than a half hour to do it but I drag shit out and I make it a whole day job um, not really all day but a good probably I'm sp probably spending triple the time of what anybody else would spend on it just because I'm picky about how the wires run and you know to do it the best way I see fit where stuff's not going to bounce around rattle around and, and break wires and stuff like that um, I'm pretty picky about that how I run my wires um, so that's why I take my time on stuff and I want to do it right and do it once if possible I'm not going to say I haven't done something and gone back after and found a better way to do it. Sometimes that happens, but in this case, I think I got it pretty nailed down how I want to do the wiring. On this, I'm going to duplicate the passenger side over on the driver's side, and I'll get that done in short order here now that I kind of messed with it and know what I'm doing. Um, that's why I suggest taking your time on the first one, and or just copy what I did. and and you should be pretty happy with it. Uh, my phone's about dead, so I don't have any battery left for the flash. But looks like the sun's starting to go down, so we have less glare here. Maybe you can see it a little better. Um, I showed you earlier.